Good morning, everyone. I think we have, uh, we're about uh, two minutes past the, the official starting hour, so I believe we can get started. I see in the, the chat room that uh, the, the meeting room is beginning to fill up nicely. We're very grateful. I think that it's a virtual room because it would be crowded. And I'm also happy to see so many people are cheerful and reporting on the weather conditions. It looks like there's a lot of snow going around in, uh, in Europe. So that's an extra reason to enjoy uh, being inside and enjoying a uh, webinar rather than uh, having to brave the elements and to see if you can actually get to uh, the meeting room. Um, Welcome to this uh, panel discussion, uh, the Data Europa Academy panel discussion. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, session uh, lined up for you. Let me quickly maybe introduce myself first. My name is Hans Schro. I'm uh, a lawyer with uh, a, a law firm called uh, Timelex. And I'm part of the team working on uh, DataEuropa.eu, the uh, official portal for European uh, data. Um, the portal, of course, where you can find a lot of uh, open data sets available for reuse. Um, but also uh, an uh, organization that uh, that's occasionally sets up these uh, kinds of uh, webinars, panel discussions on um, say innovative um, legal topics and policy discussions, things that you should be aware of when uh, working uh, in the, uh, the data economy. We have a fantastically uh, interesting topic uh, ahead of us today. I don't have to market it too much because I think we have pretty much a record number of participants. So it seems I don't have to convince you that it is an interesting topic, specifically on the concept of data ownership. Um, a, a very broad and, and, and um, not too well understood uh, legal notion. And what we want to do today is to explore perspectives uh, on data ownership, how you can approach it, but also uh, to look at the potential impact of the Data Act, what will change in the legal framework, um, and how do you uh, approach ownership, control, access, usage rights. Um, there are some very big changes coming up in the European legal and policy landscape, and this session is all about um, exploring that. Um, for your information, as I think this might be relevant, this uh, panel discussion will also be used as a foundation for uh, a specific research paper, uh, a policy deep dive on um, legal issues and policy issues related to data ownership, looking at um, you know, what categories of data people might have a legal claim to, uh, what the expected impact is of the Data Act, whether the, the concept of, of data ownership makes uh, sense um, at all. There is a couple of rules of the game uh, that you should be aware of. Uh, first of all, there is an informal rule apparently in the chat when you're saying good morning that you have to say where you're coming from and what the weather is, but maybe uh, more important uh, formal rules. So this is a webinar that uh, will be recorded and be made uh, available uh, later on. Um, we um, make, will make the recording and all the presentations available on the Data Europa Academy website. Um, we also very much uh, kindly invite you to uh, spend a couple of minutes after the webinar um, to fill out the evaluation forms to see if you've learned anything, what you're happy with. And also, you know, feel free to make suggestions for future topics, for future sessions. Um, that's important for us to be able to enhance our content and make sure that it is relevant for you. Um, in terms of um, asking feedback, asking questions, and having discussions, we do plan for the session to be interactive. You'll all have the um, opportunity of uh, asking questions to our distinguished uh, panelists, but please hold them until after uh, the session. We have about uh, an hour and a half. Um, there's a frequently asked questions section at the end uh, for about 20, 25 minutes. You will have the opportunity to ask questions then. Uh, for which feel free to use the chat. So you can enter your questions at any time, also during the presentations. Um, but we will not halt after the presentations for questions. They will wait until uh, the uh, end of the session. Um, so you know, feel free to um, ask any questions uh, that you like, and we'll do our best, uh, panelists will do our best to uh, respond to them. Um, brief introductions, maybe before we dive into uh, the, the, the topic itself. So we have um, uh, three fantastic speakers here. A privilege to have them uh, with us, uh, people who've all um, already sort of made, made a, 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 a strong print, a strong impression on, on European uh, policy, legal and policy discussions um, around data ownership. Um, we have uh, with us today, uh, Dr. Thomas Farkas, who is a, a lawyer and a principal associate in a law firm uh, of Evershed Sutherland in Hamburg and Munich, specialist in intellectual property law and uh, commercial, uh, uh, commercial issues, and also uh, a visiting industry senior lecturer at Queen Mary University of London. He is a specialist on intellectual property rights and published a very fascinating article a couple of years ago on uh, data created by the Internet of Things, looking specifically at how 
whether why you can uh, apply intellectual property rights uh, to data. So he'll be uh, talking about that aspect. We have also with us today uh, Mr. Claude Rapoport, who is the chairman of the uh, Beltalk Board, uh, Belgian Association of CIOs and Digital Technology Leaders. Um, uh, a man of many skills, I would say, a civil engineer with uh, also background in economics, uh, worked at um, IBM, but also in the automotive and, and insurance brokers industries. Um, he's been very active within uh, Beltalk over the last couple of years on topics like cloud computing and data economy, providing feedback and suggestions also to the European Commission on future legislation and uh, future policies. So he's also provide feedback and suggestions on uh, the Data Act, uh, and particularly also on um, the issue of fairness and, and data sharing agreements. And then last but certainly not least, we have also Professor Wolfgang Kerber, who is a professor of economics at the University of Marburg, uh, does research in competition policy, evolutionary and innovation uh, economics, law and economics, and European integration. Uh, he has uh, produced some very, uh, uh, very interesting papers um, on the Data Governance Act, on uh, the Data Act, and on property rights theory, specifically also on um, well, his expected impact, uh, positive impacts and negative impacts of uh, the Data Act on uh, the uh, uh, on the topic of of data ownership. So a very uh, a very uh, competent panel with uh, with people who have a lot of different insights from uh, very different backgrounds, and also, which I find a huge benefit. Um, while this is a topic that talks about um, also about legal and policy issues. Um, we have a good mix panel. It's not just lawyers. We have people with a, a very broad and varied background, which is essential because I think you know what we really need is people have a good understanding, a good grounding also of how the data economy will work. Um, so I'll, I'll provide a very brief uh, introduction on the topic of data ownership, why we want to talk about it today and, and what it means. And after that, we will have uh, three different um, uh, presentations from uh, each of our speakers, focusing on a different uh, topic, a different aspect, a different angle on data ownership. Um, that will take uh, roughly an hour. After that, there will be space for Q&A and uh, our panelists will be invited to provide some closing remarks. Firstly, maybe to um, briefly introduce the session, why are we talking about data ownership today and what is it about? I think most of us at some point have encountered already uh, the topic, the, the concept of data ownership at some point. If you're a consumer, mainly you um, encounter it when you have to accept terms and conditions or when reading privacy policies from online service providers, where they will say nice comforting things like uh, you are owner of your data, we are just here happy to provide services to you, but it's your data, uh, you own it, you decide what is done with it. Which sounds and feels very reassuring uh, because it implies you know, that you will not lose control, or that's a suggestion at least, that you will not lose control over your own data by using a specific service provider, specific service, uh, specific uh, software. But when you look at what that actually means in practice, just telling you that you are continue, will continue to own your data doesn't mean very much in practice. When you look at the details, um, the degree of control that you have and degree of influence that someone else will have over your data actually varies quite a lot from, from case to case. I'll give two simple examples just to show you how um, sometimes naive the concept of data ownership can be in, in a more complex um, digital uh, economic environment. There are some well-known, well, let me give an example that's a hybrid of real life cases. So um, look at the agricultural industry, for instance. If you use farming equipment, uh, tractors, um, uh, thrashing machines, things like that, all of those, uh, weirdly enough, are IoT devices. You know, when consumers talk about IoT devices, they think usually of very sleekly designed, nice, uh, white, curvy items, but actually industrial equipment uh, are also IT, uh, IoT items. They're also connected to the internet. They collect information and spread that around. If you have a recently built tractor, for instance, if you're a farmer, your tractor will also collect information about how your crops are doing, how the land is doing, um, what produce you are getting. They will collect data and they will place that data in a trusted platform um, provided by the uh, organization, by the company that sold you the tractor. So there's a smart platform behind it. It's no longer a simple piece of um, uh, farming equipment. That provider, the operator of that platform might tell you that you own your data, which is true in the sense that you can read your data and it will not be shared with other farmers and you will be able to get it back. 
but the insights related to that data, how your farm is actually doing, what the temperature and the humidity is like, and what the likely crop yields will be, those are also available to the operator of that platform. What are they doing with it? There have been situations, there have been cases already where um, the operators of those platforms can use that data to predict what kind of crop yields, how much grain we will have, how much wheat we will produce over a couple of years. That gives them strong insights on what market prices will be like. And on the basis of that, they can decide to speculate um, uh, in favor of or against prices, for instance, of grain, influencing um, the uh, profits, the returns that you make as a farmer. So it's very interesting because as a farmer, you're the customer of that platform. You get additional insights on how your farm is doing. That's very valuable. But you also all of a sudden have to worry about whether your data isn't going to be used against you. When you have a platform operator, are they really going to use that data only to provide uh, you with a particular benefit? Um, or is there also going to be um, a risk that the data is used against you? I'll, I'll give a separate second uh, brief, uh, brief example in a more um, industrial context. Um, a company that sells um, uh, industrial equipment, construction equipment, also equips uh, their heavy machinery with laser scanners to be able to scan the environments that they're working in, the, the ground, the terrain where the, the, where the construction is taking place, the buildings that are being, uh, being uh, uh, established there. And uh, there has been an, an, a specific case where the, uh, the vendor of that equipment collected data on uh, the environment, uh, on the terrain where it was being built, the size of the buildings, and even uh, movements across the area. So how many people were moving around there? And that was transparent. That was made uh, available, that data also to the customer. It was announced to them. It was indicated and communicated in a privacy policy. But that data wasn't shared. That wasn't openly available. That was being held by the platform provider. And as a customer, you had no ability to get that data back. And the platform operator took the position there that this is not your data as a customer. This is our data. We collected it. We generated it. Uh, this equipment, we sold it to you but you only get a license to the software and the data that we generate, it's available to you while you're paying for our cloud services. Uh, if you stop, you stop using our cloud services, you do not get the data back. So you actually have a company there that gets very detailed insights on the lay of the land, terrain, um, and uh, uh, even the, the buildings that have been established around there and uh, movements of people around that. So how, how, uh, how dense it is, how crowded it is. These are just a couple of examples that I want to give here to just to get sort of the minds flowing. I'll pass the floor uh, to um, uh, the uh, presenters in a moment uh, to give to allow them the opportunity to provide their own perspectives. But I, what I wanted to briefly illustrate with those examples is that just saying you own your data is not a particularly meaningful term. You also have to look at things like access rights, user rights, who's going to be able to do what exactly with uh, the data. And that's a much more nuanced discussion. There are a lot of questions that can be asked uh, on, on that topic. Um, and thankfully here we have um, uh, a panel of very distinguished speakers who can provide us all with um, uh, particular insights on uh, this topic, each from uh, their own uh, unique perspectives. I'll yield the floor first now to uh, our first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Thomas Farkas, uh, who can um, provide a little bit of background with at least one perspective, an intellectual property rights perspective on uh, data ownership. Uh, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hans. Um, yeah, it's it's a pleasure to speak um, on this topic to all of you. Um, so data ownership, what is your data? That's the topic. And I'm trying to give an IP perspective on that. Merely from an IP sense, is there ownership in data? Well, let's find out. Obviously, we're not talking about personal data. And to the most extent, we leave out contractual arrangements. So the way I would tackle this topic is, first of all, I want to speak about the concept of ownership and what is actual ownership. Then it's good to keep in mind a justification of IP rights um, in order to consider, does this apply to data? Does data fall within the scope? We will discuss the subject matter of IP rights as well as its limitations. Obviously, the legislator does need to give a right to IP creations, balancing also access for the public. So this is always the tricky part. We will ask the questions, is data the way it's generated as in the example of Hans or as in other examples, is that currently protected by IP rights? 
should it be protected by IP rights? And even if it is, um, or if it's not, do we need a new IP right for data? Is this necessary? All right, let's jump into the concept of ownership. Trying to make this quite straightforward, quite simple. On the left, you see the blue car. Assuming you go to the car dealer, you're going to buy the car, you pay the full price, you own that specific car. Basically, you can do anything with it you like. You can drive it across borders, you can park it, etc. Um, only that particular car. If an identical model of that car stands next to you, obviously this is not your car, it's only that one model. And unless you somehow violate uh, property rights of others, you can do whatever you like. You should not park it in someone else's garden. So this is ownership and property. Ownership in intellectual property is a bit different. As you can see on these sketches of a car, if you created these sketches, looking from a copyright perspective, you're the author and you have a right to this original idea fixated on your computer or on a paper. And with that, according to German law, you will always be the author. This cannot be transferred to anyone, but you could transfer exploitation rights. So you could tell a car company, you can own this design, maybe for a certain country, um, maybe for a certain usage, exclusive, non-exclusive, etc. So the notions are a bit different. And these IP rights also have the tendency to, um, at some stage, once they're used with the consent of the right owner, then they um, extinguish. So how does this work with this example here with a connected car? We all know connected cars, uh, especially electric cars have sensors for everything, cameras, GPS, etc. And if we take the example, you buy a car or maybe you just rent a car and you drive on the street and the sensor provides the information that on the street, there's a hole on the street and it should be fixed. So this is some information that is easy to collect. Um, or the car informs that you're always driving on a certain route. And if there's an advertisement on that route, maybe during a traffic jam, um, it could not just be an advertisement, but it could play a video because they know what you like, for example. So who owns that data? Does anyone need to own that data? If you go back to the example with a, with a hole on, in the street, um, could be valuable in order to pitch for doing the work on the street. But when I, when I prepared this and thought about ownership, I already have the question who could be the owner. It could be the driver of the car, could be the holder of the car, could be the car manufacturer, could be the manufacturer of the device that actually collects the data. So concept of ownership is quite tricky in this example. Then, what I wanted to look at as well is justification of IP rights. So if we discuss an ownership on data, we would also need to assess, is there justification to have ownership in data? The general notion is always, will there be a future creation without an exclusive right? Will you write another song if you don't get the rights to it, if you cannot make money from that? Will you do an invention, etc.? So. All these IP rights that we have are mainly based on the notion that you want to give an incentive only if I give you an IP right, some exclusivity that you can make money from, you will do further creations. Incentive. Same for a reward. For your creation, you can get a reward by having exclusive rights. Now, again, for a later stage discussion, is this the same with data? Do we need an incentive to work with IoT data? Or is it maybe already working? Subject matter of IP rights. Maybe we can draw later on conclusions from subject matter and ownership. Just some IP rights that I've mentioned, they're not complete. Trademarks, as many of you may know, it's protecting a sign that's capable of indicating origin. 
the owner is usually the applicant, so there's no real creation involved necessarily. Doesn't seem relevant for our topic as much. Patents, so you do an invention um, that is new and solves a technical problem. You can obtain a patent right, but you also must publicize um, your invention in order for others to work um, on this new invention and new technique. Usually the owner is the inventor, maybe the employee or the employer. So there's this notion of I work for someone, then I get a right. Designs, it's, it's the benefit of um, advancing aesthetic features in a product. Usually the designer or two designers um, are the right holders, potentially also the employer. Copyright, that sounds more like um, like it could be relevant. That's a protection for an original expression of an idea. So you have this one idea that's fixated. The idea is original and you will be the author. According to German law, you're always the author. You have the right to be named as the author. In some cases, the employer has certain rights. Um, database rights, so in difference to copyrights, database mainly protects the compilation of data it doesn't have to be creative, but you have to make an investment in compiling data. And that person that produces the database or does the investment, that's the owner. Trade secrets um, protect information that are valuable because they are a secret. And if you um, implement certain measures to keep it secret. And the holder is the trade secret holder. That's a bit of a different notion than an owner. So any natural or legal person lawfully controlling a trade secret. So probably for a data right, we wouldn't have any applicant as with trademarks. We could have an author or a producer, but let's see. Limitations of IP rights. So as I've said before, there's always this interface of granting exclusive rights, but also giving other people access. The goal is to strike this balance, right? Um, you need to give rights, but you need to give access to innovation. Maybe you need to grant rights and data, but you need to grant access to it as well. So can we learn a lesson from these IP considerations? For example, generic creations or non-original creations are not protected by copyright. A citation, if you cite a copyrighted work, um, that work is maybe protected, but you could have an exemption to still use it for scientific purpose. Descriptive signs are not protected by trademarks either. Um, and with patent law, anything that's aesthetic or computer programs are not protected by patent law. So they fall out of the scope. Clearly the legislator is trying to do a very balanced and distinguished approach um, in IP protection and also tries to prevent an overlap of these rights. Then in the end, any IP law, and potentially the same with a right to data, somehow changes competition. So an exclu a, a patent right that is an exclusive right, as it gives you something exclusive, it changes competition. Then we have to take into account, does it distort competition? Where does competition law fall in? Would that be the same with data? Is that data that's generated by the car that you drive on the street, um, is that then exclusive to you? Can it only be used by you or by that company, by the owner? And how does that interplay with competition law? Again, as an example, Internet of Things, I know this is not a new concept, but if we take the example of the car that I've just mentioned, or if we take simply from, let's say, from all the data that I provide in general by my online activities. Um, a video stream provider would know that on Saturday, weather's going to be bad in Hamburg, where I currently live, and I probably will want to watch a movie. My hobbies are ABC, and I probably would want to watch that certain movie. So let's give Thomas more commercials, drive the price up. He's going to buy it anyway. So all of these, uh, what I want to say with this, all of these types of uses are still unknown. I mean, there are many, 
but I guess there will be so many more which which we don't know or which we will learn. And then again, so is this data protected by an IP right? For a copyright protection, this is not an intellectual creation, mostly. It's just a vast gathering of information, which um, is completely fine. But from a copyright perspective, it's not an own intellectual creation. It's not something creative or original. So copyright, I would say there's no protection. For a database right, we've said, well, you need to make an investment to compile the data then you could have a database right. Then the question is, if all this data is generated automatically and in advance without knowing what is the purpose of this collection and do I have a certain goal with it, you could argue that the investment is actually not for compiling this actual data. It's just I invested for compiling vast amounts of data without any direction. And also in this car example, where you drive along the street and the car collects data, where is the actual investment? Because arguably, I mean, someone produced the sensor, someone put it in the car, but then you as an owner paid for that car, right? So where is this, this extra investment, arguably, for collecting all this data? With respect to trade secrets, i um, not sure if this data is a secret, mainly or to some extent it's data that's that may be publicly know, known um, so i would say in most cases you don't have ip protection for data that's for an ip lawyer always a big problem there's no protection we need to do something but do we really need to do something is it justified to have protection for data so since there's no protection, we could discuss, well, maybe we need a new IP right for data. We already have a few IP rights, but let's discuss, do we need a new one? Arguably, a new IP uh, right could increase efficiency of data markets. Data could be something to be dealt with more easily, more visibly. You would know who's the owner according to the new right, um, how can they license it, etc. It could prevent establishment of monopolistic structures, maybe. Not sure, this is, this is an argument. And definitely it would, it would change the way that de facto control over data would no longer be the most relevant thing. Because you would have a law, ideally, that would say, well, that person is the owner or the holder and they can do uh, whatever's regulated in the law with that. Then on the contrary, what speaks against a new IP right for data would be, this would completely change how we protect information. Not necessarily bad, but before we do such a shift and such a change, we should carefully consider it. As I've said before, the legislators try to have a balanced approach towards protection of ideas and inventions and data and access to it. So if we would probably interfere with this balance. Doesn't mean that interference is always bad, but again, would need to be carefully considered. Subject matter and rights, that would be still something that is unclear. What is the actual subject matter for a data IP right? How would you define data? And is it an exclusive right or is it a right rather than a trade secret that if it is infringed by an additional um, behavior or endeavor, only then it's infringed or is it an absolute right? What's the term of protection? Also something I wouldn't have a clue. Copyright is probably way too long because that is 50 to 100 years after the author's death. Then it would not solve the problem of specification or allocation. That would be difficult. But I think the main problem to discuss is, is there a justification for an IP right for data? Because I said at the beginning, it's always the main, main justification is I need an incentive. Only if I give an incentive in a right, something will happen, something more will be created. 
But you could argue, well, the industry and the data economy is working just fine. Um, they don't seem to need a new right, leaving apart contractual arrangements, obviously. It could lead to too extensive data capturing. So if, you, if I have a right, I would just capture any data that I can get, basically, and then maybe afterwards see what I can do with it. And actually, it, you could argue, and I would also argue, that this may lead to overprotection. So do we need really need an IP right for data? And some of the questions, and I've said in the beginning, I'm not talking about the Data Act. Um, this is merely an IP perspective. But if I want to protect data from an IP perspective, I would need to answer the questions, well, who is the owner? It could be so many owners. It's not as in with copyright. You say, I'm the author, I created this, or with patents. Here, I think it's really difficult. Is it the driver, the car holder, etc.? Who would be the owner or the holder, if the owner is even the right term? We've touched upon, is there really an incentive problem? Do we need protection because otherwise no new data is created? What is the subject matter of a right to data? What is the term of protection? Same thing with what's the territory? Is this again then by country or is it worldwide protection? Is it an exclusive property or a subjective right? What about limitations? What about access to data? If I drive with this car over the street and I realize the street is damaged or has a hole in it, I mean, this is obviously publicly available data. I cannot make this exclusive. And the car behind me probably collects the same data. So do we both have an, a right? Who needs access to this data if there's a right? And you could really say, is there a risk of extensive data collection? And with that, is there maybe overprotection? Are there IP rights not sufficient? And with these thoughts, I'd like to conclude my part and hand over to the next speaker. Thank, thank you very much, much Thomas. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so this is a sort of a, a primer and, 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 and the first uh, introduction of some of the challenges that you have when applying the concept of data ownership from an intellectual property rights perspective. And if this presentation leaves you with more questions than with answers, that's actually the main message to give. Because the, what you see in the presentation, the summary is, the data economy doesn't seem to need intellectual property rights as an incentive to create data. That is not where the problem lies. The problem lies more in the fact that, and this is something that's not often appreciated, intellectual property rights don't just grant exclusive rights to somebody. They also define what other parties are allowed to do with the data. And if you can't apply intellectual property rights to data, or at least there's a lot of gray area as this presentation showed, then where does that leave you as a potential or as an aspiring user of that data if you do not even have a framework under which you can really um, approach the data? If you cannot even say, this is protected by copyright, this is protected by database rights. There are paradigms that have been created for a specific problem, for a specific context. And what we're seeing in the data economy is a different context with different problems. And um, the, the, the long list of open questions here show that I think that there is a problem in applying these sort of traditional um, traditional concepts. Uh, so thank you very much, Thomas, for, for introducing that. This brings us sort of neatly into the next speaker, because while this presentation looked at the intellectual property rights perspective on data ownership, discussions nowadays focus more on um, the Data Act, which is an, a new way in which at the European level, we're trying to influence the way the data economy works to get to a result that is more innovative and uh, and uh, hopefully more efficient. I will pass the floor now to uh, our next uh, speaker, Mr. Claude Hapopo, who, uh, but I think is, is one of the experts, I don't know if he wants to be, but is one of the biggest experts in Europe nowadays on the Data Act, who will give a bit of an industry perspective on uh, likes and dislikes, fierce concerns and ambitions on the Data Act is sort of the very uh, short summary. Uh, Claude, I will pass the floor to you. 
uh, participants, again, uh, feel free to place any questions that you have already in the chat. We will get to them uh, at the end of the session. Claude, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I want to thank Thomas for this very uh, complete uh, introduction on the subject because it shows how data ownership is a real uh, worry today. <clears throat> and, uh, well, uh, is there a, a, a solution to data ownership? Well, you will see that the Data Act takes a really brand new perspective on data. Uh, and I will go on on that. And <clears throat> it intends to be really a game changer. And the main objective of the Data Act is very easy to, to, to read and create a fair data economy by ensuring a fair access and use of the data. Wow, this is not the situation on the market. So it's real, a real big challenge. And I will talk about two uh, chapters of the Data Act. One is <clears throat> B2B and B2C data sharing, and this is really uh, what we are talking about, the data ownership, and uh, you will see how the Data Act uh, handles that. And I wanted also to mention the switching between data processing services, because on that point also, Data Act is a, a big uh, game changer. So two, two points I will make. What is already clear, and because the Data Act has been voted in Parliament this month, in November, and will very probably be published in December this year. So all what is written in the Data Act is now uh, clear and the principles are clear. And when you think about implementation, you will see the rules that are there that are so different from what exists on the market. There, I will just make best guess on what will be implementation to have a practical feeling about it. So, uh, who's the owner of the data? Thomas explained better than I can do uh, how big this question is. I will just take a practical example. You drive a car. Are you the owner of the data generated by the car? For personal data, certainly, yes. And for other data, well, I don't know. Uh, you take the other point of view. The car sends all the data to the manufacturer. Is the manufacturer the owner of the data? Well, I suppose for technical data, as they can show, yes. And for other generated data, I don't know. So the Data Act doesn't talk about data ownership anymore. The Data Act talks about the data holder. We'll take this example again. You are a careful driver, and you want your insurer to know how good you drive. So you would like that some data created by the car when you drive could be sent to the insurer. Are you the owner of this data? Is a manufacturer a big question? We talked about it. So the data act says, don't talk about data owner. Let's talk about the data holder. So article three of the data act, this is really, really the wording, obligation to make connected product data and related services data accessible to the user. So this means that if there is an object in IoT generating data, there is a user somewhere and there is a data holder. So it might be the manufacturer. It might also be uh, uh, just a company collecting the data. The question is, is, where is the data? Where is the data collected? The person or the company collecting the data is called the data holder. And I think it's a game changer because when you buy a car, today you already sign two contracts, the purchase order and also the GDPR addendum, which really is mandatory. And in each uh, case, when your personal data uh, are, are used or given, uh, you have to say, I agree with uh, the usage of my personal data. And Hans explained um, how naive it can it can be, but it's mandatory. It's uh, already a big point that you should know what will be done with your data. And the data access explicitly that there must be a contract between the user and the data holder about the, the data produced by the car over the years. So. Um, what do the data holder do with the data he gets? And what is fundamentally new, so it must tell you how you can access and retrieve the data free of charge. 
So you have the right to see which data are collected in this case by the car. And this is rather new. And it goes further. It goes further because the intention is to intensify the data economy in Europe. So that uh, the, the logic is that this IoT generated data will explode in the next uh, years. It has already grown a lot, but it is not finished. It's only the beginning. And so the intention create a fair use and access to the data is really big, big business for the economy. And Europe has handled that. So you drive a car, you're the user. It's a connected product, sends data to the manufacturer. They are the data holder. You're a careful driver still the user, and you want your insurer to know how you drive. So the data act says this is the data recipient, this third party. And uh, as you see uh, at the top of the slide, Article 5, right of the user to share data with third parties. So upon request of a user, the data holder shall make available, readily available data, so the data really sent by the sensors, to a third party and with a reasonable and non-discriminatory non compensation. So the intention is to really create a data economy, but without the problem of data ownership. But you are the manufacturer. You collect all that data. In all the data is also description how you have made self-driving car, so which sensor you use for that. And so I think this is a really competitive area for each uh, car manufacturer and the sensors will send also all these data. So in the logic of open access to all data, the secrets that, that are embedded in the data are also at risk. And so uh, any company could uh, grab the intellectual property right. I don't know if that's a correct word in that case. The trade secrets uh, of another company by just looking at the data generated and asking to get them. So this was a big discussion in the finalization of the Data Act. How can you really protect security requirements to protect the trade secrets and, uh, and also security requirements? Because if you open all the data to anyone, also the hackers will get access to the data and this might be at risk. Let's look how this looks like. Uh, it's a contractual way of making the data economy. Here you see the user on the left side, and there has to be, I told it already, a contract between the user and the data holder. But the user can also say, I want my insurer to get the data. So these are the other uh, parts of the, of the triangle. Uh, and the, there will be a contract because you, between you and your insurer telling Dear insurer, I, I will make uh, the, some data available to you. Please uh, give me um, uh, a, a lower price for my insurance. And there will be a contract between the data holder and the data recipient telling which data will be sent, uh, with which security rules protected, and how protect to protect the trade secrets. So it's a market in the making. It's the objective of uh, the, the Commission is, and, and of, of uh, Europe is really to make a new market, to create dynamic uh, on the usage of the data, uh, to avoid that the data holder keep sitting on the data volumes they have uh, without uh, sharing them with, I don't know, small and medium companies be, being able to, 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 to create new services. Uh, so a lot of new aspects to analyze. And also balancing these trade secrets with open access to data is complex, will remain complex, and has to be managed. So now what is already clear, I told you the principles. Data holder is obliged to share the data. Security re requirement must be agreed. So the holder can say, I want these and these and these security requirements, and you, you must agree with that uh, dear data recipient so that uh, we can work uh, in, in confidence. And for the trade secrets, I have copied here the real text of the Data Act because this is a very uh, sensible uh, area. The data holder shall identify the data protected as trade secrets 
and define necessary measures to preserve them. And then another one which was added at the end of the, of the uh, writing of the Data Act, because some uh, companies said, I can uh, impose any uh, trade uh, protection of trade secrets I want. Um, if my data are available away or another, the Chinese will copy them despite law and despite security requirements, and they will get all the European secrets uh, in China, and they can just uh, do the whole business in all place. And so uh, this is not written here in the text, but it was a context. Huh? But they find a way to to allow re real secrets to be not given. Huh? Uh, I let you read the sentence. Um, if you can demonstrate highly likely risk to suffer damage uh, and so on, the data holder may refuse a request for access on a case by case basis. This means that you cannot just say, I'm a company uh, working with uh, special uh, technical features and uh, I, I am afraid that some uh, concurrent will copy them, so I do not give anything. This is not an answer. You must show why, where, and case by case, why you refuse access to the user. And the user can complain that uh, you do not um, comply with the data act. And then last point here, reasonable and non-discriminatory compensation can be calculated. I'm sure this will be also a very interesting matter for lawyers for the coming years and for businessmen. Uh, in the coming years. So what can we expect from implementation? Uh, let's imagine two cases. One is a data holder and the data recipient uh, find uh, common interest. It might be that some small and medium company can make some interesting calculation on data and that even the data holder is interested in these in this business. So if they have find a common interest, they will also find a way to define how they share data, how sec which security measures they show, and how much it's paid. The most complicated case is the, the new one, uh, because voluntary data sharing can exist today, of course. Mandatory data sharing, well, there they might have conflicting interests, and this will happen. And then we can imagine the definition and process to share the data will be difficult, including definition of trade secrets and security. And it will be difficult to set up in the co contract and to implement in practice. So this will be a really big business for, for, for making contracts in the coming years. Uh, commission uh, has to, uh, the, the Data Act tries to help the market some way. And um, it's written that the commission shall recommend non-binding model contractual terms, including reasonable compensation and protection of trade secrets. These are the two most complicated parts of, 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 the, of the new measures. And normally the commission will uh, try to give examples of uh, what could be done. But these are non-binding, these are just examples. So to conclude on the part of B2B and B2C data sharing, each and every contract for purchase, rent, or lease a connected product must have a data act addendum. So I think all the producers of Internet of Things uh, will, will, will have to look very fast at how they can manage that. Because imagine uh, uh, a million users who, who must answer uh, to, just like GDPR, uh, what, what, they, what, what the data holder will do with my data uh, and so on. So they must find a way uh, to solve this problem. They could find a way with GDPR. So I think they will find a way also for this. When? When is that mandatory? 20 months after the official publication, we said probably December this year, so this month. So you count 20 and you arrive in September 2025. So this is absolutely clear. What might happen is that the user wants to uh, ask for data to the data recipient, then a new contract. If, in fact, two new contracts, user data recipient and data holder data recipient. 
So really new business, really new markets, really new perspective, uh, very interesting. I think uh, the intention of, of Europe was really to, to boost the data economy, was to say uh, this is the economy of the future and here are some rules that might be used and uh, please data holders share your data so that the business goes on. And uh, But there are also the security and, and trade secret protection. So this is about this chapter of the Data Act. I wanted to show another chapter of the Data Act because it's also a game changer. It's switching between data processing services, cloud service providers. So uh, all the business uh, are going to cloud service providers today and there are large cloud service providers from the markets that are taking most of the business. And today the situation is absolutely locked in. Right. Only 5% of cloud service providers in agreements include the switching and exit clause. This means that the customer enters the contract with absolutely no idea how it can get out, how long it can take, and how much it can cost. So this is locking because the providers put their high costs. And the, Europe was aware of the situation of the market and decided to change it. So it's really a game changer. Uh, in the Data Act Chapter 6, there are different articles, and I just have taken here two to show you how important that will be. Removing obstacles to effective switching between providers of data processing services. So your uh, company or an administration with a lot of data, you have put them in one cloud provider and you want to get all that data out. Well, the provider must give assistance to help you get the data out there and they cannot put any obstacle because this rule is removing obstacles and there is a long list of obstacles that are not allowed. And then article 21, 29 is also a really big game changer because today when you want to get out of such a contract and you're a big company, it can cost 1 million to get out. Just to give a, a, a number for telling you it might be very large. And the, uh, the data act says gradual withdrawing of switching charges, including data egress charges. Well, from date plus three years, so uh, providers shall not impose any charge on the customer for switching process, including data egress charges. So this is a very big game changer. How fast will the provider comply with that one is a big question. So, same approach, what is already clear. From September 2025, switching and exit clauses are mandatory in the contracts with very specific uh, um, elements that have to be included in these switching and exit clauses. From the same time, the switching cost must be reduced to not exceeding the direct cost. So it's a, a little bit the same logic as a rooming cost uh, for the mobile uh, telecom. Uh, they had said uh, rooming costs are incredibly high, they must be zero, and there is a transition period where the uh, rooming costs will decrease. The same logic here. The switching charges are really high. They should be zero in September 2028. And so in the meantime, in the three years before, they should be reduced to the operational costs. There are some limitations to avoid uh, abuse from the, the customer to the cloud service providers. Uh, if you make a contract three years and you stop after uh, five years and you stop after three years, it's normal to have early termination penalties. Um, then if you have some very specific services, then the provider can say, well, these services are too complex and I cannot help for switching. All these are custom built and uh, the data act doesn't apply to custom built services. So what do we expect for the implementation? My personal best guess, in all cases, switching brings a lot of worries and will never be pleasant. The commission wants to make a real change on the market to restore competition. And the commission intends to publish a cloud rule book in line with the data act. So with a lot of clauses that uh, may help, for example, administrations to uh, 
uh, write contracts uh, to with, with uh, cloud service providers and all public tenders might require the compliance with the cloud rulebook so uh, this might be a way to force the cloud service providers to respect uh, the cloud rulebook at that time i think this was my last slide so I thank you, and I give now the word to the next speaker. Thank you very much for that, Claude. And um, before we go into to, to Wolfgang's session, just wanted to stress how important uh, the, the this, this, this introductory that session that you gave on, on Data Act, how important that it actually is, because it shows the shift of, uh, of the paradigm, of the way of thinking about data ownership rights. Um, the data act doesn't look at you know what incentives you need to create data because none are needed the data is being created that's a natural part of the economy and it doesn't focus on identifying a privileged owner of uh, of intellectual property rights who gets you know exclusive rights to decide things it takes it focuses on the reality of the situation there is a data holder and there are categories of of people of organizations users or recipients who receive certain rights towards that data holder so it, it represents a complete turnaround of the IP paradigm, rather than saying we want to incentivize someone uh, to create data by giving them exclusive rights. It actually focuses not on how to generate more data, but on how to make sure that that data can be exchanged and used in an economically beneficial way. At least that is the uh, ambition. Um, but, and I think that Devil is of course in the details, I think this is also a good point uh, to uh, pass the floor indeed to the next speaker, um, whether it will be able to achieve those ambitions and what the the, the, the challenges might be. There's a lot of points of discussions there yet. Uh, we are having fascinating discussions actually already in the chat, so I look forward to that. But first I pass uh, the floor to you, uh, Wolfgang. Many thanks. I'm very happy being here and it's great um, uh, having my presentation after the presentation of, of uh, uh, Thomas and Claude, because this helps me a lot in, in my presentation. Now, um, you know, the policy background is European data policy, which uh, exists since 2017. And so I will also talk about the Data Act. And uh, what I'm presenting is mostly based on two paper I've written, uh, one about generally about uh, Data Act and why it might not work so well and one uh, co-authored with Martina Ecker, another economist, where we look really now from a property rights theory and bundle of rights perspective, and that's exactly also about this uh, implicit uh, data ownership discussion. Uh, I only would focus only on, on governance of, of IOD data, so not about switching um, uh, between uh, data processing services and um, now, what are really the problems in IoT context? Now, um, in the legal situation, it's very clear many general IoT data are personal data, then you have GDPR, and, but there are also non-personal data for which we have no theory rights and it's not protected by IP right, as we have seen. Uh, but, and that's very important, data holders can have exclusive de facto control over the data. And this is a decisive point here. As this is also the starting point of the Data Act itself in, in why we need here these specific rules. So the point is that the manufacturer of smart devices can get through their own technical design exclusive de facto control over all data generated by the device. So the manufacturers themselves decide on this that they get exclusive de facto control, and this can lead to access problems for users and firms. Now, I also have the example of connected cars, and I'm happy that we already have talked about this. And um, this is exactly a discussion we have since 2016. The problem is that the car manufacturers have really gotten now exclusive de facto control on all the data in the connected car. And what they're doing is they have uh, really designed the car in a way that all data are directly transmitted to a proprietary server of the vehicle manufacturers. And nobody else can access this data, also not the owners of the cars. And so they have exclusive control about the access to data and also the technical access to the cars. That's about the inability issue. So they have economically and from a competition law perspective, a gatekeeper position. And therefore, they can also get control of also secondary markets, the repair and maintenance markets, and other service uh, markets, other services, because they control this very important input. And this has negative effects on competition, innovation, consumer choice. And that's exactly also what the, uh, uh, the 
commission has also in mind to solve, help to solve these problems. Um, this is a, a discussion we have since 2016. The commission is aware of this, but so far it has not solved it. And this leads exactly now to the objectives. The objectives are really on one hand, more user and also consumer empowerment and for getting better additional services, especially also competition on secondary markets, so more repair and maintenance services, et cetera, but also unlocking data to make more data available to firms for innovation. Because this is a problem that also the commission has all seen there are enough data, but they are not used enough. And this is exactly the problem um, of the, that the European data policy is addressing since a few years. And this is now a mandatory solution. And the other is fairness and allocation of value from data among actors and, but also the data also intends to preserve incentives to invest in generating values of data. And they are using two key instruments. So one instrument we already have seen, the new rights for users to access IoT data and share them with third parties. But also, and this is also, Claude has also explained this, uh, the need for a contract because the data holders are only allowed to use the non-personal data on the basis of a contract with the users. These are two different uh, instruments. Now, the basic architecture we already have seen, Claude, um, important is, but also that you see it all starts with exclusive de facto control. And then you have Article 3 making this uh, accessible, Article 4 right of user access, Article 5 shares the data with third parties, then this contract between user uh, and the data holders about using this. Uh, but important is also all of this only focus on a limited amount of data on your raw data and pre-processed IoT data as a rather narrow definition, but not to derived and inferred data. Now, what we have done now, our research perspective is now really to look from this from a property rights perspective, and that's the economic property rights theory. And what they have done uh, is um, to deconstruct this term property into a bundle of specific rights. Um, and then ask from an economic perspective, what is the optimal design of this bundle of rights and who should get these rights or the assignment of these rights to different actors. Yeah? And this bundle of rights approach is also used in the law, right to use, access, manage, transform, transfer data. And important, these rights can be assigned to different actors. Uh, one application is to innovation and IP. We have heard very much about this from Thomas, uh, but also with regard to data. And what is very important is that economically data is non rivalrous in use. So the data that one party can use also another party can use. And this is some basic economic rationality for the whole European data policies is non rivalry in use. Now, what we know from the whole discussion from last years is that how these data, the bundle of rights of data should be, can be very different because we have very different economic and technology con conditions. So you have not a one size fits all solution. This is very different and so we need very different data governance solutions. And that's the problem. Now, what is the status quo? The status quo is exactly, and this is what we have right now, before now that, that uh, Data Act enters into force. So the status quo is that the manufacturers have to set the factor control over data economically a property-like exclusive position on non-personal data. They have no the jury rights on this data, but through the exclusive control, it's a position as if they would have a property. And they can use these data, they can de facto license it, and they can also sell it. That's the situation right now. Now, how has this de facto exclusive emerged? The point is that the manufacturers, if they are designing a technical device, they can choose between different technological solutions. And as economists, I know they will try to maximize the profits. So they will choose a technical design which maximizes the profits. And therefore, it's not surprising that um, IoT device manufacturers choosing a design that allows them to get exclusive control and therefore to capture exclusively all data generated by these devices, as we have seen with the, with the car data. And therefore, they can also capture all the value from this data. And this is exactly what is a problem now uh, for the commission and why there is a problem, because it's often not optimal from the perspective of society and might be a wrong technological change choice, and therefore, we need a solution. Now, the Data Act, um, 
now wants to change this de facto bundle of rights, but it's interesting that, it, uh, that the Data Act does not question this uh, technological capture. They accept it, yeah, but they try to limit the negative effects of the de facto uh, control. Um, and how does the Data Act doing this? It's exactly these two instruments giving the users right to access and share the data. And secondly, that there's this contract between users and data holders, which might give the users some say about what the data holders are doing about the data. These are the two instruments. Now, the main problem is, and uh, I cannot go into the specifics here, that first, uh, the Data Act is full of unclear provisions. There's inconsistencies, contradictions. I think there will be high implementation and compliance costs. So if you read uh, the articles of the lawyers, they have a long list of problems. Uh, but more important from my perspective is that this basic idea of this of these user rights and the data sharing mechanism where you make these data available to other parties for innovation, that this mechanism will be de facto rather weak and very ineffective. And this is because they have put into the Data Act too many restrictions, too many requirements, also about rate tickets, but also about technical protection measures. The scope of data is very small and cannot use for, for, for many services. So we have high transaction costs. So in my um, opinion, um, I am not optimistic that many IoT data will be shared with the Data uh, Act. And this is mechanism because it's not really attractive for the users to share it and for third parties to get data using this. And this is a real problem because this uh, makes the Data Act ineffective. And the Data Act is not based on a clear legal concept and not based on a clear economic concept. And this is exactly now of the bundle of rights. And therefore, what we are discussing in this paper is three different bundles of rights concepts about these data. And one is where we have an IP-like situation, like bundle of rights uh, for the data holders. So the data holders have something like an IP-like situation. The other is that you assign all these data to the users. And the third one is this co-generated data, where you see, OK, both data holders and users perhaps co-generate the data, and therefore both should have rights. And this is what we are analyzing step by step, and I will do this now, right now. So first, these data holder-centric IP-like bundle of rights. And um, now what we see is, if you, if you read the Data Act and try to understand it, then the best way of reading it is, and understanding it is, you think that the Data Act wants really to assign the, the kind of ownership to the data holders, because many provisions in the Data Act falls and in line and seem to make sense. Yeah, already the technical capturing of the data that's accepted fits to this. Then that the economic position that uh, so this exclusive control is similar to an IP like protection fits into this. Then also that the Data Act is justifying this exclusive de facto control of the data holders through an incentive argument. You find often in the Data Act this argument that uh, manufacturers need incentives for investing in data generating IoT devices, and therefore it is important. And then also that data sharing with the body requires a kind of licensing congress between the third parties and the data holders. Yeah. So it's, it looks like that the data holders are licensing the data. And also the Data Act has a lot of provisions also for protecting the de facto control. So it's a pure de facto control. Uh, for example, remedies against out on unauthorized use, technology protection methods, but also the option using only in situ access. Yeah. So this all looks like a kind of IP analog. I am very cautious, it's not a right. But what does not fit in this uh, analog is now really um, this, this contract between data holders and data users. Now, can such an IP-like position could this be defended? So an incentive problem. Now we have heard all from, from Thomas a lot why we there is presumably not an incentive problem, but there is especially no incentive problem with IoT devices because these IoT devices are sold by the manufacturer to the owners. And therefore, with the price of the, of, for example, the car, uh, the car manufacturers can all uh, cover all the costs for data generation. So there is no justification for an additional monopoly position 
force of the car owners, uh, for car manufacturers for monetizing this data. And this monopoly position has a lot of high costs for society because this exactly leads to this underutilization of the data and, for, and the possibility for closing competitors. So in that respect, the Data Act seems to follow to a large extent uh, such an IP-like concept. Also, it cannot be defended economically and has negative effects on objective. Now, the other option is now and um, said assigning the bundle of rights, non-personal data to the users and in the sense of an exclusive assignment. Yeah. And the point is that especially uh, through the changes through the European Parliament and the final version of the Data Act, also this position has been strengthened. So you find in the final version of the, of the Data Act now in, in the new recital 26 explicitly that only the users should have the right to monetize the IoT data. So the data holders do not have the right. Um, and also explicitly said uh, this should enable also liquid, fair, and efficient data markets by using the data from these data sharing rights. As this was before not clear whether we whether the data actually would like to have data markets in that respect. And the idea is that then third parties can resell also the data through these data sharing rights and and data intermediaries from the Data Governance Act can also aggregate them, and this would lead then perhaps to more data driven innovation. That's, that's the idea. So the final version clarified much more than, than before that there's a clear assignment of the idea to the users. Now, everything depends now on the contract, because everything, what, what's happening now, because yes, this contract between um, the um, the users and the manufacturers. Now, in B2B situations, usually we can rely that uh, freely negotiated contracts between firms are working well. So in that respect, we usually have no problem. And But in B2C situations, this is very different. In B2C, we have exactly the same situation that we have with personal data that um, we all have to agree uh, in all kind of contexts uh, to the processing of our personal data. We have no transparency about it. We don't understand what they're really doing with this. This gives us meaningful control about this, about the personal data. And it's the same thing will happen with non-personal data. So we have a market failure here. Yeah, and the Data Act does not help us as consumers yeah, to solve this market failure. So the Data Act does not give us a meaningful control over the IoT data because the data holders can tie the sale of their IoT devices with, the, with this contract where we give all these data de facto to the data holders. And therefore, we have a problem, and I think therefore we will have the need additional regulatory measures for consumer protection. Another question is whether it's a good idea at all to make an exclusive assignment of IT to users, because does this really lead to more innovation? Is there a motivation of users sharing the data? And therefore, there was from the beginning, there was large skepticism about the entire concept of um, using this user-initiated data sharing mechanisms for really making more data available. Now, the other interesting concept uh, would have been co-generated data. And co-generated data means that more than one actor contributes to the generation of data. And um, then all co-generators should have rights to use this data. That's a basic idea. To some extent, you find this in the Data Act, because in recital six, it's very clearly that says that uh, the data act sees that these ID data are co-generated by manufacturers and users. Now you can go further, and this was this very interesting concept of co-generated data by uh, Axel Metzger and Heike Schweitzer, who said um, it would be good if data holders and users should have parallel and independent rights to use and share and monetize IoT data. So both have the same rights and can use them independently from each other because this would prevent monopolization of data and would allow competition between data holders and users with regard to the data. And this would be much more innovation and competition friendly. But the final version did not embark on this, this path, but really uh, went back to, uh, exclusive, to the exclusivity of data. Now I come to my last two slides. So conclusions. In the Data Act, what we see is an, an IP-like exclusive bundle of right concept on non-personal data is really primarily used. It's still unclear whether more to data holders or to users, because uh, there are many contradictions in the, in inconsistencies in the Act. 
and the specific design of bundle of rights is still unclear. And this market failure problem regarding the contract between a user and a data holder is not really solved. Now, in my view, the objectives of the Data Act, I think, will not be achieved. I'm very pessimistic about this. The data sharing mechanism will be rather weak and largely ineffective. I'm skeptical whether we will get thriving new data markets with that. Um, it will not help much innovation and competition, perhaps if we add additional sector regulation. And I also do not see much empowerment of consumers. Now, on the perspective, if we really want more innovation and competition, we have to go much more further. We need bundles of rights, which make more IoT data broadly available for users and firms, more direct access to rights for firms, perhaps data trusty solutions, perhaps also more for IoT data for training AI, which is not so for the Data Act or for research purposes. <clears throat> I find very interesting this alternative model of the Commission in the um, European health data space. In the European health data, we have a very different model where we, are, we have a far reaching opening of health data for secondary use, for innovations. The Data Act does not do this. So in that respect, I think the Data Act might go in the wrong direction. I think it would lead to a, it entrenches a strong possession of the IoT manufacturers, especially so the idea of also, that they can contract away the data from the users. So it's a danger of a path to propertization, and it also will incentivize technological capture of data. And therefore, I'm, I'm skeptical. Also, I agree it's a game changer because we are starting something and perhaps we have then really also to improve it in, in further legislative act we will see. Many thanks. Thank you very much for that, Wolfgang. I think um, your presentation, while you know, of course, being uh, more critical clearly than 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 the, some of the other presentations, I think it shows also one of the the, the big challenges that the Data Act tries to deal with, which is that it is so generic and so broad in its scope. And some of the other sort of alternative models that you presented, like uh, health data spaces and mobility, those are targeted more towards a specific sector where there's a common context. So it makes it it makes it a lot easier to work with than um, having such a, a generic um, uh, generic scope. And we have a bunch of questions in the chat. I'm going to try to pick out a couple of them. I, I'm not sure we'll be able to deal with all of them, but we'll we'll do our best. Um, some of which also, uh, to be very brief on that, also relate to data protection. We emphatically try to steer away a little bit from data protection in this session because this honestly is already a very complicated topic without considering the, the data protection implications. Uh, but it's true, as some people have pointed out, th the Data Act actually is fairly, depending on how you look at it, uh, either lazy or very realistic on data protection issues in the sense that it basically says you know, data transfers have to be lawful under GDPR, so there has to be a legal basis for uh, transfers of personal data, um, either you know, for a user, if you're a natural person, if you're a citizen requesting your own uh, data back, that actually falls already under GDPR. But companies trying to uh, get access, trying to exchange other people's personal data also need to have a legal basis. It does not say that you have to have consent. There can be a masses of other legal basis. All of the ones that are permitted on GDPR are possible here as well. But it doesn't go into a lot of detail, which will undoubtedly be one of the challenges also in, in it's going to say in establishing the paperwork but that's disrespectful there are actually fundamental issues that need to be solved and transferring personal data but so we won't go into the personal data questions but there are a very a couple of very interesting ones also just on um the scoping and the general vision uh of of the data act and how that affects data ownership and we actually see a lot of questions uh in the chat that relate that link the issue of data ownership basically to data sovereignty um, it, it is a data act that talks more about data holders and users and recipients, not so much about sovereignty, uh, but a lot of the underlying philosophy is indeed sort of about being able to stake your claim into saying, this is my data, so I should be able uh, to, uh, to control it. And what I found interesting actually is that there are a couple of questions also that talk about specifically the ability of individuals, individual people, not companies, but individual people to take charge of their own uh, data. So. Uh, we have two questions actually that I want to see if the panel has any specific thoughts on that, on uh, using solid technology, um, so being able to to create isolated pods that contain your own personal data for a specific user that you can then unlock to different um, data providers, so that basically you don't have to rely on a data centralization model anymore, where there is one holder 
and you have to convince them somehow to extract the data. Rather, there is a part of data, which can be personal data or non-personal data, that you can make um, uh, available or uh, accessible to other users. This is interesting also. I think maybe this is more relevant to Wolfgang, but I'd be interested in, in, in all three of your opinions. This is basically further technologizing the, the data ownership question. I think you, uh, maybe to rephrase it this way, so the Data Act kind of takes a governance perspective, saying, OK, we'll have data holders, and here are users and recipients who have certain rights to it. The questions essentially relate to if we want to support data ownership and data um, uh, sovereignty for individual users, would it have been possible and maybe even preferable to use more technology-driven solutions and saying, you know, rather than focusing on access and sharing rights, um, we should use we should focus on these technology solutions that take data away from the data holders. They can access them, but they are not the owners, basically, of it. Um, I don't know, if, Wolfgang, if you have any thoughts on that or other uh, panelists as well, of course. It's a very big question. It's a very important question, and, and I'm, I'm happy to, to say something. Um, in the discussion about connected cars, there was from the beginning, from 2016, there was one solution about in, introducing a different technology about interoperable uh, telematic platforms. And this technology would have allowed that the car owners or the car drivers would have direct control over the data. And this would exactly be this, this, this example, and they could directly say they would like to share that data with someone else, with service providers, for example. But the point is that the car manufacturers are not at all interested in developing this technology, because then they would lose their control about these data. And therefore, the problem is we can try to, to solve, to, to go in this direction, but then you will need really also technological regulation. So you have to regulate the technology because uh, firms themselves are often not interested in developing such a kind of technology. And then you have to make an additional step in policy. Yeah. And so far, uh, I think uh, policy is not, is not willing to do this much more cautious. It is. From that perspective, you could arguably say Data Act is a sort of a European compromise solution. It doesn't go that drastically saying, OK, data holders, we will take your toys away, which would indeed the impacts would be, to say the least, very difficult to predict uh, from that perspective. But rather to say, look, we just want to make sure that the data, this critical resource that you have, is not just yours. I think this is an important point of the data ownership discussion. Um, and I think on, on, on that point, this is also similar to the IP rights uh, model, essentially, where I also said, look, even if you own an intellectual property rights, you have predefined legal exceptions that you have to be able to grant. You don't, the fact that you own an IP right doesn't make you, you know, the, 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 the dictator of that specific data set. I don't, Thomas, I'd actually be, be interested in, in, in hearing your perspective. How bizarre are these data act discussions for you from a, from a, an IP rights perspective, you say, okay, this still looks and feels kind of like an IP right to me, or is it too far out there to be comparable anymore? No, it's it's as I said before. From an IP rights perspective, you 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 have a subject matter that you try to fit into an IP right. With data, it doesn't really work. And then usually there's a big scream like, we need to be incentivized. We need a new IP right. This is important. This is good for the economy. Then you realize, well, not sure if it is. So so I'm a bit torn. But then on the other hand, I'm, uh, I'm also torn in the sense that I don't think there should be a de facto monopoly either, especially when, when there's so many, well, at least participants that help create all these data, right? I mean, just the car doesn't collect any data. You need the driver, you need further assets, you need the sensors, regardless of the example you take, but then but then the driver shouldn't be owner of something exclusive either. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe more from an IP perspective could consider of it more being like an open source consideration where you say, why not give it to everyone? I mean, as Wolfgang said, technically, if you can, if you can make silos, etc., it's going to be difficult, and it's, it could be a way forward, but it's going to be difficult. Why not have it like common knowledge or open source? 
it is actually it is an interesting point that it has that openness philosophy and you know there is the conviction uh, probably an accepted f fact that more data sharing would be beneficial for the economy but also for societies also for citizens in general um, but it's very difficult to find uh, sort of a uniform ways to handle this and this is also uh, but like I said, I think, uh, Claude, this came back in your presentation as well, the fact that this is both B2B and B2C. When you look at users, actually, I had to look it up just to be sure that I got this right, but users, the people who are um, able to get their data or to be able to authorize or, or mandate even the, the sharing of data from, from a data holder, users have very broad definition. It's natural or legal persons that own, rent, or lease a product or receive uh, services related to that product. So that's literally, as a as a data holder, even if if you're you know you're not used to that, you will have to deal with be able to deal with uh, consumers, with citizens who are exercising rights uh, to their own data, which is actually a very big um, a big shift in, in in the way data ownership is is being dealt with. And it's not just in the GDPR sense where you say, okay, there's a data subject exercising their rights to receive a copy of their personal data. No, this is a lot broader because you are allowed to, to draw additional people in the ecosystem. But also in the chat, there's also a question, uh, I'm not going to look it up, but a concern from the other perspective that this whole, as a citizen, you might be comfortable with one data holder having that data. But if someone else can say, well, you know, um, this data holder has data related to my customers, I'm going to move it to somebody else now. Uh, as a citizen, you don't necessarily really have any say into it. So controlling those data flows is very complicated. I, do you have feedback loads from the sort of the business community on, are they confident? Are they nervous on how to be able to deal with this? Because it's, it's potentially a lot of people who can come to you with very complicated questions. Well, uh, from the beginning of uh, discussions on the Data Act, uh, the business users came with the, the balance problem, the balance between the openness and security and trade secrets. And we saw also the text of the Data Act evolve in this one year uh, between both. Uh, I like uh, the, the idea of the user trying to have a, a kind of a coffer with all his own, uh, his own data coming from the different objects he uses. I am very curious uh, if there will be a business for that. It would be interesting if some business uh, try to develop with this idea because this will be really uh, something brand new on the market. Will that be possible with the Data Act? Well, theoretically, yes, the user must have access to his data. And normally uh, objects uh, put on the market should give direct access without uh, first the step of collecting and then the data holder giving access. So normally, uh, it's written that uh, uh, the objects coming on the market from 2026 should uh, give direct access to the user, to the data generated. But at the same time, uh, this balance still exists because uh, the data holder can define the security rules to access the data. And <clears throat> I can imagine that for them, the easiest security rule is to say, we keep the data central, and you just have the right to read them. And then if you want to implement some kind of personal coffer with uh, all data in, well, the, the, this software for personal coffer has to go uh, as the data copies the data with difficult security shames uh, based uh, with special IDs, and I don't know how, to all these uh, data holders. So uh, I, I think it's a, a very interesting case. And I think Wolfgang said, well, uh, all possible rules for security protection help uh, the proprietary monopoly, technological monopoly of the existing data holders. So uh, it will be very interesting to see uh, uh, if, if some, some trade-off comes in the right direction. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, it's it's a, certainly a very well a complex topic and and I mean we're we're at the end of the session so I'll, I'll just invite you in a moment to just sort of make a closing uh, statement on on sort of what what for you the key takeaways are and and what messages you would like to give to the audience um, before giving you each the floor for that you know short statement I think maybe it also is worth considering the connections with other initiatives because we mentioned here the Data Act and um, 
uh, in chat, people have pointed out, you know, this this is also connected to the AI Act and its need to consider uh, risks and um, uh, to, uh, to consider the risks behind specific use cases. There's a link to the uh, EIDAS identity wallet concept where citizens have to have, well, or will be allowed to have a wallet containing their own personal data. There's a link to the Data Governance Act. Uh, someone in the comments mentioned the, the, the Finish My Data Initiative, which is sort of a data intermediary perspective essentially it's, there's a lot going on if you're in the sphere you have the data act you have the ai act you have the uh the idas amendment you have the data governance act a lot of this is moving about so um how will people deal with all of those challenges look at all that that breadth of of changes coming at them from a regulatory perspective which try to reconcile indeed data sovereignty and data control for individual users with the need to make sure that data gets exchanged it's a lot to handle. Anyway, I will just give each of you the floor to make a short closing statement on, you know, what you would like people to remember or what you might have learned maybe uh, in uh, this uh, this discussion. Uh, I'll maybe I'll go chronologically and get in the order of presentations. Thomas, what is the the, the main takeaway from your perspective? Um, well, main takeaway could be so there is no factual there is no IP right for data. But maybe a factual IP right could be created. And I guess we will just need to wait and see what the act really provides. Uh, with maybe keeping in mind, I mean, uh, any big act that changed the law um, needed, to, uh, needed to be adapted. Maybe here we keep in mind the real IP notions and uh, then IP history in order to implement and then further develop a proper act that suits everyone's interests. Basically, it's sort of a data act resulting in an, an ecosystem IP or technological IP in, in practice, yeah. something uh, along those lines. Excellent. Uh, Claude, from your perspective, what's sort of for you the main takeaway? Well, a positive point uh, is that uh, Europe has really tried to do something brand new in addressing the problem of data ownership uh, and, and has produced a document taking into account input from all uh, parties on the market. Uh, also protecting the EU European manufacturer with their trade secrets. Uh, so that's a positive point. Europe did something. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure uh, in other parts of the world, they really tried to address a problem. They uh, really tried to address a problem and hear all stakeholders. So negative point, uh, and I was not aware of uh, this uh, before the speech of uh, Wolfgang here, it, it might be in the wrong direction. I was not aware it could really be a wrong direction. So I will read the slides from Wolfgang in detail <laughs> to feel better the different angles and viewpoints that can, can come there. If, if, if even our experts are learning, I consider that the biggest compliment we can get. Uh, Wolfgang, you get the, the honor of the, the last sort of statement of, of lessons learned or takeaways. Yeah, I'm sorry that I'm a bit skeptical about the Data Act. No, but I think it's it's a big game changer in that respect that it really addresses new questions that have not been so far addressed. That we really see that de facto control is a problem and that we have to find better solutions for that. I think this is very important. But what I would like to see is that we have much more um, much more first economic analysis because this is not good economic analysis what they have done and for us comparing more different gov data governance solutions and comparing the advantages and disadvantages and i think uh, the, the, what they have really then decided on the data act might not be the best solution for that but they also have not discussed alternatives and this is what what i do not like at all in, in this discussion and they should have discussed alternatives and therefore we should make more research about alternative forms of data governance and one one way or the other we will be forced to learn in the coming years with you know data act and data spaces and data governance and intermediaries and so forth so this it's, it'll be a time of learning um, we are being pushed by legislation to learn, um, but you know we've had that experience in the past. It's been said that the Data Act is, is GDPR all over again. We'll have to see if the net effect is, is positive in a few years' time. So um, we are out of time. Uh, so I want to thank um, all of uh, the speakers for the very interesting contributions and for uh, the very uh, interesting discussions afterwards as well. I also want to thank, thank the audience very much for participating, for listening. Uh, you have the QR code on the screen Please provide us with feedback, what you liked, disliked, what you'd like to hear more of. I also want to thank particularly the people who raised questions. 
because I think you've provided in the questions also some uh, further uh, suggestions on future topics. I think there's there's much more that we can dig into and we'll be, be happy to do that as well. Um, and uh, as we said, the both the, the presentation, so the, the recording and the slides will be made available to you uh, afterwards. We'll disseminate the final report that comes out of this to you as well. So uh, a final thank you to everyone. Uh, and since we are approaching mid-December, I also wish you uh, the very best already for the end of the year and a happy holiday season. Thank you very much. Have a great Thank day. you so much. Thank Same you. to you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.